What we have learned with the development of next generation sequencing is that not two tumors are the same. Uh, every tumor has different mutations and mutations are the drivers of tumor biology. So with advances of next generation sequencing, we have been able to identify and group different subtypes of uh, kidney cancer according to their mutation status. So specifically, my laboratory discovered that the BAP1 gene is uh, inactivated in 15% of clear cell renal cell carcinomas. And we found that BAP1 mutations are associated with high nuclear grade, which led us to hypothesize that those patients that had BAP1 deficient tumors were going to have more aggressive tumors. Furthermore, we found that mutations in BAP1 tended to anti-correlate with mutations in the second gene discovered by the Sanger Institute by Mike Stratton and Andrew Frutrell, the polybromo-1 gene. So that led us to a classification where we find that about 50% of the patients with clear cell renal cell carcinoma will have PBRM1 deficient tumors and 15% of the patients will have BAP1 deficient tumors and a small percentage of patients will have tumors that are deficient for both genes. And in a very productive collaboration we have had with Mayo Clinic, uh, which re with uh, Reed Joseph and Alex Parker, we've been able to determine that these different subtypes are associated with very different outcomes in patients. So patients that have tumors that are competent for both BAP1 and PBRM1 have excellent survival, whereas the cancer-specific survival is very poor for patients that have tumors that are deficient for both BAP1 and PBRM1. BAP1 deficient tumors have a somewhat intermediate phenotype and the PBRM1 deficient tumors are similar to tumors that are competent for both BAP1 and PBRM1. So we think that for the first time we've been able to identify subtypes of a clear cell renal cell carcinoma which are likely to inform therapy in the future. Um, there is a gap between the, the discovery of the gene to the determination of the clinical implications and subsequently to the therapeutic developments because the therapeutic developments are going to emerge from biological understanding which we don't have yet. So that's actually a very good question. So what has traditionally happened is that a trial may be performed um, and one may find a group of patients, um, sometimes small, sometimes larger, that appear to do well with that agent. But if the group of patients is a small, the trial is considered to be negative uh, and the drug is abandoned. Um, and the problem, I would say, is not that the drug did not have activity. The problem is that we were not able to identify the group of patients that appear to benefit from that agent. Um, so the classification that we have uh, developed and the identification of these different subtypes will pave the way to be able to do correlation so that when a clinical trial is executed, one is able to characterize uh, better those subset of patients that may benefit from, from the agent. For instance, as I was alluding to before, the BAP1 gene is inactivated in 15% of tumors. It's possible that one of the drugs that has been tried in kidney cancer could have activity against that group of patients, but there could never be a trial that is positive, just being active in a small percentage of patients, in 15% of the patients. So by um, identifying meaningful biological subtypes, we hope to deconvolute uh, kidney cancer and it, it, it probably makes sense in trials going forward uh, to do pre-specified analysis of, uh, of these genes that we now define different biological subtypes to be able to get at the question whether a particular treatment is having a greater effect in one biological subtype versus the other. Um, and it's possible be that uh, it may not be the, you know, all of the PBRM1 deficient tumors that benefit from, that are uh, inhibited by a particular agent because there are other mutations, but it's the beginning that will hopefully lead us 
to, to the identification of those biomarkers of the patients that, that benefit or also that are most resistant to a particular treatment. That's also an excellent question. These are discoveries that uh, we and others have made over the last two or three years. Uh, the implications um, clinically have, be have begun to be unraveled, but it's going to take uh, significant effort and, and an investment in research for us to go forward. We need to understand how loss of these genes, how mutations in PAP1 and PRM1 um, are affecting processes inside the cancer cell leading to, to, to kidney cancer development. And in particular, uh, we need to understand how PAP1, which is associated with the most aggressive uh, type of kidney cancer, is inducing that process. How is it that loss of, of the BAB1 gene makes the tumor be very aggressive? It's only once we are able to elucidate the signaling pathways that we will be able to identify targets for therapeutic intervention. On the other hand, we already know that for patients with localized disease, their, their prognosis uh, is influenced by the biology of the tumor. So I was alluding to before, those patients that have removal of a primary tumor localized to the kidney uh, that is deficient for bab one and PRM1, they have a very high likelihood of recurrence in, in a short period of time. Those patients whose tumors are uh, wild type for both bab one and PRM1 can do very well. And importantly, from the point of view of translating these findings into the clinic, we've been able to uh, develop uh, assays, immunohistochemistry assays, that are routinely performed on, on tumor samples at most institutions. So that allows us to very quickly determine whether we are dealing with a wild-type tumor, BAP1 deficient, PR1 deficient, or a tumor that is deficient for both.